Welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. In the past, I've been known to apologize for long episodes. Not today. The fact that we came in under an hour and a half is a minor miracle. You know my theme, that was then, this is now? Today, the lines blur. Sandy Kay is a media personality and podcaster in Australia who interviews just about every single name in the music industry that you can remember from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. In fact, A Breath of Fresh Air is now my go-to podcast when I'm walking or sitting around of an evening. I love it. While I came to this conversation with my usual set of notes, one name led to another, which led to a story, which led to a memory. I could have talked to Sandy for hours. If music has been even a minor part of your life over the years, you'll love Sandy. And you'll love her podcast. Listen now. Today's guest contacted me in November of 2023. And when I checked out her website, it was an instant, yes, please be a guest on the Boomer Woman's podcast. I'm excited but also a little bit nervous. I don't want this to, I want this to be a really good conversation. I don't want it to seem like a gossip column. (laughs) Uh, Sandy Kay hails from Australia. She's a freelance broadcaster, journalist, and producer who has spent more than 35 years on both sides of radio and television microphones. On her about page, she says, like most people, I'm really into the music I grew up with, the soundtrack of my life. I never seemed to grow past what I believe was the heyday of music. Of course, I'm talking about the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when music exploded and musicians weren't afraid to try anything. These are the sounds that take me back to my youth. The blues and R&B speak to my soul. Pop and rock reminds me exactly where I was when I first heard the tunes. Sometimes it was driving in the car. Other times it was at school or university. And occasionally it was when I had met a boy and we shared a kiss. That sounds so like the 881 songs I have on my old iPod. (laughs) Nowadays, Sandy's passion project is called A Breath of Fresh Air. I'm going to let her take it from here. Sandy Kate, welcome to the Boomer Woman's podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Agnes. It's such a pleasure to join you. I'm just as excited as you are. <laughs> <laughs> but you're used to the lineup that I've got on my other my, or my other monitor over here. It's like, holy crikey, the, the, the list just doesn't stop. Tell us about A Breath of Fresh Air. Okay, so I'll take you back to where it started. As you mentioned, I've been a broadcaster, both television and radio, since I ran away from an arts law degree at university back in the 70s, much to my father's total disgust. I wanted to be part of the media. Anyway, I've done loads of things in media, and the, the up until the pandemic, I was an entertainment reporter on various radio stations. I do live entertainment mainly so I could get free tickets to shows and movies and music and that sort of stuff, right? Smart woman. When the <laughs> When the pandemic hit, uh, a few of my radio stations contacted me and said, is there any way that you could do what you do but blow it out to an hour so that we're filling up our slots because so many of the presenters didn't come in to do their shifts anymore? So I said, okay, I was always up for a, a, a bit of a challenge and I started to produce a radio show on my little laptop. So I'd been a radio producer in days gone by and I started to produce six segments you know, per hour and it was taking me the entire week to get it together. I thought this can't continue. Gradually I started paring it back down again and w- we devised a, a one interview, one guest per hour segment where I could really let the interview breathe and and really chat to people in depth, as most podcasters do, I I was to discover. So a lot of my radio stations started taking this show and I reached out to a lot more across the world because everyone was in the same situation. They all had dead air that they needed to fill. So, so many stations started to take it. Now there are more than 160 stations right around the world that do take a breath of fresh air. And at that stage, I knew nothing about podcasting other than, you know, a couple of podcasts that I would listen to. And I thought, well, why not throw this radio show up as a podcast and see what happens to it, which I did. I didn't change a thing. I just put it up as as was. And gradually, gradually, people have been kind of coming to it. 
funny though, you know, I knew I understood all about traditional media and I knew nothing about podcasting. I still don't think I understand the rules around podcasting. And I'm actually not sure that anybody quite does. Everyone's like making it up as they go along. So that was the genesis of A Breath of Fresh Air. And I get a lot of feedback from listeners all over the world saying, I love what you're doing. My mission was really to reach out to the, the artists that I liked when I was 14, 15, 16, 17 years old and have a chat to them, ask them all the questions that I would have liked to ask them then and see what they're doing today. So when I started to reach out, lo and behold, they were at home. It was the pandemic. They weren't doing anything else. And they said, yeah, sure, Sandy, I'll talk to you. And, you know, the more I got, the more I could get. When I was a, a young researcher or producer in traditional media, and working for various radio and TV shows, I used to pride myself on the fact of being able to find anybody anywhere in the world. And of course, a lot of the work that I did was pre-internet days. So it was quite easy, given that you've got the internet to track people down and to call them up or send them emails as you do and pursue it. I'm, I'm a bit like a dog with a bone. If I don't hear from you, I'm going to try again in a week's time. And if I still don't hear from you, I'm going to try again in a couple of weeks' time. So they couldn't get rid of me even if they wanted to, really. So I've been very fortunate because I've attracted some huge names to my radio show, show slash podcast, and they have just been such wonderfully warm, candid, honest fireside chats that I've had with people that uh, it's it's been very special. I'm going to... Stick with the technical for for a few minutes, but then I want to get into the nitty gritty. But I will throw out a teaser for our listeners. In scanning episodes, I saw names like Kenny Loggins, BSNT, The Temptations. This is the hardest list I've ever made. Six names instead of a hundred. Steely Dan, Grand Funk Roll, Railroad, Gary Puckett, and The Union Gap. It was literally two weeks ago that I was singing along to Young Girl. <laughs> <laughs> in the midst of a bunch of young people who didn't have a clue about the song. Anyways, I was going to ask you how you connect, but you're you're just bold and brazen enough to just call them up or email them or whatever. You know what, Agnes? I was fired from a, a particular job in radio back in the late 70s, I think it was, because I, I used the telephone too much. I rang up a, a, a huge bill in those days when you <laughs> tried to reach out to America from Australia it would cost a fortune. But I was, I always reached out big. I was reaching out for, for people like Danny Thomas and Mickey Rooney and all sorts of Hollywood stars that I could bring in as the producer to my radio host. So I've been really used to doing that all my life. Now, of course, it doesn't cost a thing except your own time and energy. So yes, I follow them all up. And whether it's through you know, their own websites or through management or through agents, whatever it is. And it's that old story that once you have a few of them that have said yes, that I can direct them to my website and they see in whose company they see it. So they they also, well, I mean, there's a lot that do say no too, let's be frank, but, you know, quite a lot do say yes. I, it's an opportunity for these guys who sadly are dying out it's an opportunity for them to tell their own stories in their own words. And the nature, of course, of, of a podcast is that it's evergreen. So what I'm hoping, it's not like a radio interview that's here today, gone tomorrow, and it's not like a printed interview that you'd have to really dig to find what they had to say. It's in their own words, in their own voices that will last for generations to come. So I kind of, maybe I kid myself foolishly that I'm leaving a bit of a legacy behind where, where future generations can go to, you know, hear what Gordon Lightfoot says about Gordon Lightfoot now that he's he's left us. Uh, there are so many already up there that have gone and I'm sure there'll be many more, unfortunately. Yeah, that's the hard part about this age is that all of our heroes who were 10 years older than us are starting to go. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to start at the beginning of your podcast. Your intro is a medley of several huge hits. YouTube recently put a warning on my intro, even though I paid for it and I had a license. H how do you pull together an intro like that? 
Um, it's really easy for the radio show and and uh, not only the intro, it's the outro, it's the music I play also. So for the radio shows, it's all fine. I face the same thing with YouTube and I they often, the podcast goes up to YouTube and often it's blocked or, or curtailed or whatever. So what I do then is put up the separate video interview of the person without any intros, outros, music in between, so that YouTube viewers can have a look at that interview as well. It's a pain in the neck, all of these music restrictions that have come into play, isn't it? And I'm sure that over the next few years, we're going to see that change because you and I are both producing up professional podcasts and you want to soup them up with with bits of music and stings and stuff so that it sounds professional. I mean, any Joe Blow can put up a chat with somebody and and it's as boring as anything, even if it's not boring, but it's plain and it's not produced up at all. So I'm sure that platforms like YouTube will start to change their view on, on on the use of music in the next few years. I think the whole podcast thing is developing so rapidly. It has to, if they want podcasts to sound really professional and slick, of course, music is a big part of that. Yeah, I had bought my um, my music, my intro and outro uh, uh, five years ago. So of course, then I'm into this big thing of tracking back to see, because of course, that company doesn't exist anymore. Finally found the company that's using that or holding that piece of music now, sent them my receipt, sent them a copy of my license. They I've really good story here is they they contacted YouTube almost immediately. So once I realized that I they had to put a copyright thing on my music, um, within a week, it was off. And then I get a list of emails for each and every uh, video, of course, that they had uh, blocked, but uh, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's life, isn't it? If you if you don't want to make money from YouTube, you're okay, you give it the you give it to the YouTube uh, viewers and listeners. But, of course, if you want to make any money, you've got to strip all that stuff out of there, which it's crazy too. It's just double the work and half the quality. Yeah, yeah. Now, you started with Paul Williams. That's pretty auspicious. <laughs> um, yeah, he was he was my first one that I put up as a podcast. Again, that was during the pandemic. It did take me a long time because I, I was um, – doing bits for radio before that. So I chased him for quite a while through his management before he agreed to do the interview because he never gives interviews. And I felt very, very special that that he had agreed to talk to me. And so I should have. His chat, he was just the most forthcoming man who was so happy to open up about all of his drunken disorderly days and how he'd been so many years sober and how he had reinvented himself and was giving back to his community in in the form of being an alcohol counsellor, alcohol and drug counsellor himself. So he sits with groups and, and, and counsels people, not as Paul Williams the artist, but as Paul Williams the alcoholic or the recovering alcoholic. A very, very special and, as you well know, incredibly talented person, very underrated, I think, in my opinion, and and I think in a lot of people's opinion, a very special, very special chat that was. I loved him Uh, and I had loved his music. I remember as a 12, 13, 14-year-old, I loved all of his music so much, yeah. Well, I found it interesting with with your interviews and obviously I haven't listened to all of them yet. That's coming because I walk every afternoon. But, I mean, we all know, for example, with Paul Williams, we all know an old-fashioned love song. We know a lot of those Carpenter's hits that they sang of his. But things like, I didn't know that he also wrote Barbara Streisand's Evergreen. Yeah, now, he did. Do you know all that because of your career or do you do a lot of research as well? No, I do a whole lot of research. I can't go on and talk to anybody except you. Without doing very <laughs> I've done much my research. research on you, trust me. <laughs> well, you can't. I mean, any professional interviewer has to know who you're talking to. The guiding rule of interviewing is you only ask questions that you know the answers to. <laughs> so I do do a fair bit of research on the person that I chat to. Otherwise, you get stuck and uh I mean, your best questions, you can have a list of questions, but your best questions always come from the the last answer that the person gave you. So you follow on from there. 
but yes, I, I only knew that in research. I hadn't known that growing up. There's a lot of things that I'm learning that I didn't know as a teenager when I was writing to this music also about these artists, but it's such fun discovering. And you know what, Agnes, is the best, well, one of the best parts of it is as a teenager, holding all of these artists in such high esteem, you think that they, well, we thought that they were like super gods. We had their posters on our walls and, and the records. We we cuddled every night and, you know, touched and read everything we could about them. They were like superhumans. And now as I, as I chat to them, and as you said, they're, most of them are really only about 10 years older than we are, which at the time seemed like a, you know, like a lifetime older than you and I. They're really just ordinary people who have been given a, a, a talent and we've all been given a superpower of some kind. The music or the writing of songs, the playing of songs, whatever, is their super talent. And they're, they're, they're not they're not such superhuman beings. I think probably they might have thought they were superhuman in the days when when they were on top of their game and and they were being treated as such when they were flying around in private planes and imbibing in lots of different things that they shouldn't have been. But today, you know, in the, and most of them are in their 70s, some in their 80s, they're regular everyday people who you know, eat breakfast the same way you and I do and go out for a walk the same way that you and I do. I mean, you, you mentioned Kenny Loggins before and my interview with Kenny Loggins took me in some strange directions because I found out that during the pandemic, he and his latest wife uh, had bought themselves e-bikes and spent a lot of their time pedaling around Los Angeles looking for the best donut in LA. It's like, <laughs> that's not something I knew or had set out to find out about him, but you know, that's pretty ordinary stuff. And then when when he decided that the the donuts were starting to show on his waist, they started playing pickleball, the two of them. They're ordinary people like you and I, just perhaps with a little more money up their sleeves. One more technical question. Just you mentioned Kenny Loggins, or you focused on him. How much editing does your person have to do? Because I can't imagine getting someone like Bruce Coburn or Judy Collins on the line and going like, oh, yeah, well, we've got you know, like half an hour to talk. It's like, I just want to let them go and have the conversation and then worry about it later. But how, how long do, are some I of I do do that. Well, they're, they're starting to get longer and longer, I have to say. It took me a while until I started to pay Zoom uh, to go beyond the 30 minutes uh, when I was producing it up as a as a radio show with six segments, I was cutting everybody up to about ten minute segments. So from from the thirty minute Zoom conversation, ten minutes was ample. Unfortunately, I should never have done that. I should have gone the whole hour or more, and I'd have a lot more material for some of the early ones now. But now some of them are going an hour, an hour fifteen to cut up into my shows run fifty two minutes exactly every week because they are also a radio show. So I cut them into three segments or one whole fifty two. I have to cut quite a lot out of them. I haven't gotten as far as as a Patreon account or you know something like that that other people do that put up the bits that you don't use because I figure the bits that I don't use are actually the worst bits. Why would anyone, <laughs> anybody want to pay for the worst bits? Uh, I can't, I can't go there and, and make and, and get people to subscribe yet at all. But there's the, the ratio of, of what you actually hear to what I've recorded is, uh, is quite great. Do you want to know the hardest editing job I ever had to do? Of course. I mentioned him before. It was with Gordon Lightfoot. I I chased Gordon for a, oh, a good year and a half before they granted me the interview. His management finally said, okay, you can talk to him. And I was so excited. He was really one of my superheroes since, child, well, since teenagehood. And when I got Gordon Lightfoot onto the phone because he, he couldn't do Zoom, he could only do the phone. And it's it's not, as you would well know, it's not as personal to talk to someone on the phone as, as on Zoom and you keep talking over each other. But it was like talking to somebody's grandfather with their hearing aid out. It was woeful. And it was, I couldn't control it very well because it was on the phone. It was the worst, the most difficult edit job I've ever had to do 
to to make it sound completely coherent. And he was um, so candid with you. I listened to that one. He he was, wasn't he? He really went, and there were parts there that I couldn't actually use because he talks about an ex-wife, and and then he says to me afterwards, "Oh, and no, I look sorry, I shouldn't have said anything about her. Please don't use that bit." So I didn't. Uh, of course, I didn't. If he says don't, but he he was. He really got. He really bared his soul. I thought to me, he was really honest, and we talked for quite a while. I was devastated when Gordon Lightfoot left us, although I'd had a heads up that that was what was coming. My friend Dan Hill had tell, had told me what state Gordon was in before he went. But he lived it pretty long and pretty hard, Gordon Lightfoot. And I think that's what a lot of them are, are finding these days too because they led the life of rock and roll back in the day. Their health is playing a huge part in their well their their ill health is playing a huge part nowadays they're really suffering well it's like those those, some of them are saying I'm happy to be here I'm happy to be anywhere because the fact that they lived this long is yeah uh, yeah a miracle pretty yeah absolutely um if people abuse themselves like that that's what they've got to expect and that's another thing that I'm hoping future generations can hear and learn from was the abuse that these guys went through and 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 what the consequences of it has have been now in their 70s and 80s although they say that young people don't learn from our mistakes they have to go through same but i guess you know any any advice perhaps if as parents we can't teach our children but perhaps with musical icons um sort of professing the same maybe young people will listen a little bit more who knows well, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but up here in on Western Canada, non-alcoholic bars are becoming a really big thing because oh, really? a lot of younger people are just saying, meh, can't be bothered. So yeah, there's there's a lot of hope for them. <laughs> so. Well, I don't think we have them yet. That's a really interesting concept. So I, I love the sound of that because unless people do go to a bar and drink, where are they going to meet one another and and find new friends other than online? And that that that's the option, isn't it? That's yeah, fabulous. Yeah. And so um, a lot of bartenders now, whereas they used to experiment to try to make the next great cocktail, they're now experimenting to make the next great mocktail. Yeah, it's it's huge out here. Really, they're yeah. real. They're really well attended, are they? Yeah, yeah. As I say, some of them so, are just. Only only non-alcoholics. Wow. So young people are actually discovering that they can have a great time without alcohol. Preferred I like to. it. <laughs> yeah. I like it a lot. That's awesome. I now, might suggest that here. Oh, there you go. There's another business for you. <laughs> yeah. Now, in some of your interviews, you say, well, the last time I talked to you, so tell us a little bit about your past career, because you must have had some interesting careers as well as getting fired from that radio station. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, I certainly have had. Um, a, as I mentioned, I, I was Sydney, Australia's first female newsreader on radio back in the days when female voices weren't allowed to be on the air at all. The, the, the guys would all say that the female voice is much too squeaky and it's not allowed to, to be on air other than a traffic reporter on radio. And, of course, these days it's all females everywhere. That big male booming voice on radio is is in, in the minority. Now, I um, went to, well, while I was working as a researcher and then a producer for radio stations, being part of a radio station in those days meant that any rock and roll band that was coming to town you got to meet. So whether it was John Mellencamp or John Waite or, or um, you know, the monkey, well, no, actually I wasn't working when the monkeys came to town. I was a bit too young for that. I can't even recall. But whoever came to town, you got to meet and, and you got to interview as well. And as my career progressed and I started doing much more television and I was doing current affairs and uh, entertainment television, I was doing lots of interviews too. I was also the person on the ground here in Australia for American television shows like Extra and Inside Edition. I don't know if you have them in Canada, but when they needed interviews with either Australian artists or American artists that happened to be visiting Australia, I was the one that had to go and get them. So, you know, chatting with people like Baz Luhrmann, who who just recently did the Elvis film, or uh, Russell Crowe or um, Keith Urban, some of our better known Australian artists, I'd have to go and chat to them or 
more recently, there was, uh, I can't even remember her name, from from um, Desperate Housewives. Uh, I can't remember her name, but I was the one sent to have a chat to her. So, yes, I, I did chat with many of them. But I'd also done uh, interviews that I'd pre-recorded and, and used when I was just doing entertainment on radio. So anybody that was touring Australia, I'd do a quick, you know, five-minute interview with and put it up as a, a little grab through my social media and on on the radio stations that I reported into. So you mentioned Gary Puckett and the Union Gap. I mean, they'd come to Australia pre-COVID and I had a chat with with him. So where I where I say I've you know, good talking to you again. It's sometimes that I've met them a few years ago, but it's also, I find that it's, even though I've only been doing these podcasts for three years, I'm already coming full circle. Some of them are coming back here again. So for instance, I think I've got another interview with Gary Puckett that hasn't been played out yet that I'm holding back. Uh, And I probably say to him, I've spoken to you again, or one with Walter Trout that is uh, just going to air now where I spoke to him pre-pandemic and got his life story then and he's about to tour Australia so we've had another chat. Um, the ones that of course that that come here they're easy to get hold of because the publicist wants you to chat with them. They're not then so happy with me if I hold them back. I've got about oh I don't know a good six to nine months of of back issues ready to to be edited to to be put to air still and and it's always a bit of a challenge to decide who I'm going to cut for this week because I need to get the ones that that are a bit older that may uh, pass before they get to air, which would be terrible. I don't know if you remember. I mean, in Australia, we grew up with all the music we had from the UK, from Canada and from the States, as well as our local music. I, I Did you get the same? Did you get your local music as well, of course, from America? Did you get the UK music come through Canada as well? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah the, the so you were... You were that's right. You were pretty much the same as we. We got it all. Yeah. I mean, the, the the UK got didn't get as much American stuff. They had their own, and they certainly didn't take music from Canada or or Australia very much at all. And the same with the states. It took people like Bruce Coburn and Gordon Lightfoot, for that matter, so long to crack the US market. But given that we had it all, we were so influenced by so much of the music that was coming through, and. Uh, we had access to to everything it was it was fabulous actually we thought we were very far away from where the music was being made but in some ways we were lucky because our radio stations took from everywhere and it took australian music a long time to come of age before they could feel confident enough to start writing about australia and uh, it wasn't really until the late 70s where they started writing about Australian culture and it started to become accepted in the in the UK and the US and of course Canada was much more receptive to our music as we were more towards yours too. We've always kind of paralleled each other. Well I think except in Canada a lot of our big name musicians for the last number of decades they have to make it big elsewhere they don't get the respect they they deserve in Canada. You know, same so, here this yeah. is the same they, everyone wants to go to the to the states, to yeah. that's where well, that's where the audience really is, isn't it? Talking about Canadian artists and one I haven't put to air yet, I had a lovely chat with Andy Kim, the other, the other week. He was fabulous, and I there was a lot I didn't know about him that I'm very excited to bring to our audience. You've got some great artists there that, and uh, Burton Cummings from the Guess Who. I haven't put him up yet either. Um, I'm waiting. What a lovely man he is. And as I said, so humble and so down to earth. It's it's just lovely to discover that with each one of these. I think that's the that's the thread that runs through them all. I haven't really met one that that is too high and mighty, or they're really all very down to earth and lovely people. You may be are noticing too th- something that I noticed just a week or so ago. I listened to their, our domestic broadcaster, our public broadcaster. And of course, you know, the guess who, the, there was all sorts of people, Neil Young, they were coming out of Winnipeg, Manitoba back in the 60s and 70s. And I guess recently there's been another rush of people out of Winnipeg, Manitoba. And the public broadcaster, a younger person, a younger announcer is going, like, I just can't believe all the, the talent that's coming out of Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I'm going like, 
excuse me, they seem to be able to <laughs> create this, uh, I don't know, this group of musicians that are just amazing. So it's kind of funny when you, you've got more history than the people you're listening to on the radio sometimes. Um, yeah, well, the radios, uh, they're trying to attract a younger audience, aren't they? That's for sure. Yeah. But uh, And it really disturbs me when the young people who claim they're into music have no idea who's come before them, where it's all come from and the history of it. So in a lot of ways, I'm trying to educate them too. It, it kind of surprises me in terms of the podcast. When you look at your analytics, I would have thought that my show is specifically for baby boomers, you and I that grew up with the music that want to get behind the person and get to know them a little bit. It's, it, it feels, well, it should feel, I try to design it so it feels like you're a fly on the wall or sitting having a cup of coffee with that person in the room or overhearing what they're saying in a cafe perhaps. But uh, some of my, uh, quite a percentage of my audience, maybe 30% of my listening audience is in that 28 to 45 year old bracket. And I I'm really pleased by that because that means they're learning about their forebears, which is fabulous. I remember working in a television current affairs newsroom one time and we were looking for a commentator on some issue and the newsroom is made up of younger people. I was certainly one of the most senior people there. And we're trying to kind of think about who would be able to commentate on this particular issue. And I suggested somebody and they all looked at me blankly and said, who's that? And I said, oh, my God. I mean, he's this incredibly well-known journalist for the last 50 years in this country. How do you not know that as young journalists, you know? And they had no idea. I mean, painters know their, who came before them. They know the artists of, of note. Musicians certainly know who's come before them and know the history of the music that they're playing. How could these young journalists not know the, who who really would have and should have been their mentors? I was shocked. Okay, speaking of shocked, and we seem to keep on going back to Gary Puckett, you said something that surprised me, that he is still touring. Now, I, I didn't have a clue about that. Do you ever have people maybe even come to Australia and you go like, oh, they're still around and and they're still popular, I guess, amongst their basic fan base, but they maybe don't have the global popularity that they did when they were the first the first time around. There are lots that come here. There are there's I mean, there's this whole genre called heritage touring now, and I'm sure you're aware of the the tours that people like the Turtles do and the romantics and and bad company and bad finger all, all of those guys there are a lot of them that still do tour what's it called the I can't remember the name of the hits of the tour that the people like the turtles go on but they're very popular and what's become incredibly popular are these rock cruises do you have them around canada not that where, I've heard of, but... <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Here's an idea for you. Yeah, yeah. That, that they're all over America where all these old bands jump onto the cruise and it's billed as this rock cruise. It's a blues cruise or it's a rock and roll cruise where, where people like Bill Haley Jr. are on it or, you know, a, a whole lot of other names. And people like you and I go on this cruise maybe the first, maybe the tenth time in our lives and get played to by all of these bands that we grew up with. But not only do, do they play to us, uh, we can, you know, sit and have a meal with them and chat to them and, and get to know them a little bit like that too. So these rock and roll heritage cruises are a huge thing. I think certainly down around the Miami area and I think all quite all over America, a lot of people write to me and tell me they're going on these cruises and a lot of the bands that I talk to, uh, you know, play the cruises, that's their regular revenue these days. Uh, there was a guy called Toby Bow. I don't know if you've heard of him. I can't even remember the band he played with, but he was like hopping on the cruise and he'd be, that's how he makes his money these days. So there, a lot of these old musicians are finding, well, it's the same audience really because it's you and I, but maybe we bring our kids and our grandkids along to, to hear them. They're playing just as well, if not better these days than they did in the day. Uh, but they found a whole new way of making money. Many of them are telling me that that touring to Australia is just too far. They're not going to fly that far anymore. Their health is no good, so they're not willing to take a long flight. A few in the UK will, you know, go as far as the east coast of, of 
America, perhaps they won't even fly to the West Coast anymore. So they're being more restricted and playing and more local clubs, but there's definitely still a huge audience for all of this music. In fact, they're enjoying a resurgence in their popularity that they haven't seen. I think it went kind of quiet for them in the 90s and 2000s perhaps. Now it's big with a huge bang. They're, they're huge again. I think maybe because, A, they want to do it again before they pass away, and perhaps you and I want to go see them again before we do the same, when we all relive our youth together. Well, I wonder too, you're just talking about the demographic that, or that 30% demographic that does listen to your podcast, is all, I have three kids. They're getting, they're all in their late 30s. They can sing along to all those hits because oh, that really? was my playlist when they were little. So uh, yeah, so they quite enjoy when a song comes on. They still sing along, even though they've got their own you know, dem or music right now. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of fun just listening. So maybe. Yeah. Well, it's it's all those kids there that that stumble across my podcast that I kind of want to go, tell your parents <laughs> yeah, about right. this podcast <laughs> because nobody knows. And once I, I've never heard anybody who's who's listened to any of the interviews of mine who've said, oh, no, that was terrible. What a waste of time it was to hear them. If there's a favourite artist that, that you have, Actually, and what I do, Agnes, is for anybody, well, for anybody listening now and for anybody who does tune into my podcast generally, they can write me and say, I haven't heard from this person for a long time. I'd really like to hear them from them. Could you track them down for me? And then when, uh, of course, that's what I'll do. That's my, my biggest pleasure is to find the person that you want to hear from. But also, if you'd like, I'll put you on the air with with that person so you can actually say hi to that to that <laughs> musical star too I had a fabulous chat with Don, Dennis Lokieri talk about not knowing how to pronounce names from Dr Hook and he was the most wonderful person I know I, know I keep saying everybody is the most wonderful person but he was really fabulous and there was a lady in Sydney here in Australia who had requested him so I got her on the line and she turned into a giggling 15-year-old also, you know, Dennis, I remember when you did this and that and I love this song and can you tell me why, why you did it like this and all sorts of questions she had. So that's just my greatest pleasure to be able to hook up a listener with an artist and, of course, the artist doesn't mind at all and the listener just gets such a kick out of saying hi to their favourite person. It's terrific. <laughs> and maybe brings it all right down to the listener's level in terms of like the listeners, plural. The, oh, that could be me. Or who would I like to, to talk to just yeah. for that three minutes or whatever? Yeah. Who, who would you like to talk to, Agnes? Well, Is it's there funny, as you, were, as you were saying that, I'm thinking, oh, man, all of my favorites are gone. Like, you know, the really my heart throbs, you know, the ones of the, you know, George Harrison and, okay, I'll admit it, Elvis Presley. <laughs> You know, there's there's so many that are gone that, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind well, of sad. I can't, I can't help you with those, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to help yourself when the time comes and find well, and, them and on even, the other side. You know, Chuck threw me over for a younger woman all those years ago, and now he's married to Camilla. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hooped. Yeah, there you go. I think he, I think he did you a favour, Agnes, <laughs> yeah. personally. But, you know, one that I've, I, tr I really tried talking about teenage heartthrobs, I was a little bit young for him. He was before my time, but I certainly remember how huge he was in the day. And I'm talking about Bobby Sherman. I was wondering uh, about that. Yeah, I saw his picture on your thing. Uh, yeah. Oh, my Lord. I chased that man through his new bride for a good two years. I was relentless until one day to the greatest surprise of mine she finally she not he he was willing yeah. the whole way she finally said okay you can talk to him but you can do it via zoom but you can't have the camera on why can't I have the camera on he's not shy because she insisted on doing the interview with him and she didn't want to be seen on zoom in case she didn't look good I mean she's all of I, I don't think she's turned 50 yet but anyway, I was I was pleased. I got him on the line. And the first thing I said to him is, Bobby, can't you turn the camera on? And she said, oh, no, we're not camera ready. We're not camera ready. And he says, I'm camera ready. And she said, well, I'm not camera ready and you're not having the camera on. 
So we didn't get the camera on because we know who wears the pants in that family. But it was fabulous talking with him and, and him because, again, he doesn't speak to anybody. The last interview that I could find in existence with Bobby Sherman was from 1984. He, I don't think he's done anything since then. So I felt very lucky that they had agreed that, uh, to talk to me. And and uh, I think I got around it because they run a children's foundation. And I said, I'm really happy to talk about the children's foundation. The more people I can let know about this foundation that could possibly donate some money, the better it is for everybody. So she allowed me to do that. But it was terrific talking about him being the pin-up boy of, of all the girls' walls. You know, I mean, I think you and I come from the David Cassidy pin-ups or the monkeys' pin-ups on our walls rather than Bobby Sherman. Well, no, uh, I, Bobby Sherman's dimples, I will admit. You liked. He was gorgeous. And when he sung and the girls screamed and he talked about girls climbing up drain pipes on the outside of his hotels to try and get into his room. And he said... I said, well, how did you feel about that? You had all the security outside your door. How did you feel? He said, well, I didn't mind. He said, I was pretty happy that they were trying to get to me, but I was worried that they might fall and injure themselves. He is your all-time homegrown American boy and such a lovely person. I was quite shocked at, at how gorgeous, again, I'm using that <laughs> word to describe my talent, but he was, and and uh, I was so thrilled to get it, to get an interview with him. It was terrific. <laughs> You could probably tell me stories for hours and I would just sit here with a big goofy grin on my face. One of the things listening to some of your podcasts or some of your episodes that I loved was, you know, listen to somebody that, you know, right now I'm picking and choosing because, I, you know, there's so many there that I can just go, oh, yeah, that one. But to find out because you break up the interview with a song or something like that is, oh, I didn't know they sang that song, you know, so the song was huge, but I was not aware that it was sung by that mm. person who was super high profile, but uh, yeah. didn't put it all together. Yeah, I like to, I like to do that. It takes me so long to find all this music and, and stick it all in. And I, I, I'm educated by that also. And, and I think I grow through each of the interviews in, in my knowledge as doing this and also finding the songs that, that they did before they became really well known in the bands they started out with and how they morphed into who we know them as today with their huge hits. So we all know the big hits. We know they've done that. But, you, do, I mean, for instance, who was I talking to the other day where the, the, he, oh, I haven't got time to find it now, but his band consisted of the future members of Led Zeppelin. Um, and I can't remember who it was, and I never knew that. Oh, it was Donovan, Donovan Leach. Of course it was. Donovan Leach, when he did Mellow Yellow and Sunshine Superman and all those hits, there were members of Led Zeppelin playing that. I mean, how do how does a Led Zeppelin get from being a studio band playing Mellow Yellow to playing all the Led Zeppelin songs? The journey is incredible. And actually, that's one band I'd still want to speak to. I haven't managed to talk to anyone from Led Zeppelin yet. I spoke to John Bonham's sister, who runs her own band, which is kind of a Led Zeppelin sounding thing. But um, I, I love their journeys. I just love where they started from as children. And most of them, in, it, it's actually interesting too. None of them tell me they started playing an instrument when they were 25 or 40 or getting interested in music. Then they've all been interested in music since they were children. Many of them fostered by their parents' love of music. Many of them just had music around the house as, as your kids did and, and their love for music grew as a result. Some of them sang in church choirs. A lot of the black artists, that's where they got their musicality from and grew from there. Um, but they And the ones who play instruments started when they were five years old or 11 years old. And I, I find it incredible that to develop a talent to where you're the best in the, in the scene takes you playing from 11 and having all that passion right up to where you kind of break through 
in your in your you know twenties, thirties, whatever. Actually, most of them did break through in their twenties too, because that was the heyday. That, as we started off by saying, was the explosion of music when it all started to happen, and and they all kind of got their break then, and have and are still doing it now in their seventies and eighties. Most of them never for a minute considered that this would be their lifelong career ever. It was just their passion, their hobby. They didn't, they dropped out of university or, or even school to follow their passion. Sometimes their parents said, yeah, fine, no worries, go with your passion. Sometimes their parents were really angry and, and uh, disowned them as a result, but they all followed their passion. And, well, obviously the ones I speak to are the ones who've been completely successful at it and wouldn't have had it any other way. Yeah. And you wonder like a group like Queen, how often did they think they were done? And and now every done. every six months, I'd say <laughs> they were ready to pack it in. And uh, that's right. And then it just kept going and going and going. I mean, Elton John, he also he, 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 he never considered that that was going to be his career. And Bernie Taupin was really the making of, of Elton John. Uh, as was uh, Sonny Bono was the making of Cher. I just I spoke just the other week. I don't know if you had if you've had a chance to listen to Darlene Love, who was one of the greatest and earliest session singers of of all. She's been on more records than you can think of, more hits than than you could absolutely dream of. And she tells me the story because she just put out recently a Christmas song with Cher whom she befriended when Cher was 19 years old. And she said she met Cher in the studio. Phil Spector was doing a session in there. And Darlene was supposed to be singing in that session, but her car broke down. And Sonny Bono was one of the backup singers at the time. And she says, oh, Sonny was the worst backup singer ever. He couldn't sing. He couldn't hold a tune at all. He wasn't, she wasn't sure how he ever got a job singing. But Sonny had come along that day with his girlfriend Cher, and Darlene was delayed. So Phil Spector said, well, Sonny, you, your, your girlfriend, you told me she could sing. Bring her up to the microphone. Let's see what she can do. So this 19-year-old Cher who'd never sung a note and was very shy by nature stepped up to the microphone and started to sing. And Phil Spector started yelling at her, get away, back off from the microphone. You're being too loud. You can't do it like that. In walks Darlene. And she heard Phil's abuse of Cher and started telling him off for screaming at this poor young girl. Well, as a result, Cher's career kicked off. Sonny started driving her whole career. The rest we we all know is history. But Charlotte, uh, Darlene's friendship with Cher has lasted 60 years because she stuck up for young Cher then. And this past Christmas, Cher called Darlene, says, I want to put that Christmas song of yours onto my latest album. And uh, their friendship continues. As a result, Darlene is back on top of the charts again. Amazing. I thought saw Cher interviewed on uh, Graham Norton out of England um, just recently. And it was, uh, oh, my God, yeah, she's just nonstop. But, um, yeah. You know, one of the stories that I, I love hearing or having heard, um, Nora Jones was doing a song in studio recording and they decided it would really pop if they had just somebody doing a little backup thing. And I think it was like a Saturday afternoon or something. No, Nobody was in the studio except for Dolly Parton. <laughs> so here's this, and at the time, no name pretty much, Nora Jones, and she's got Dolly Parton as backup, <laughs> you know, so things like that. It's, uh, yeah, it's great. And Good story, story, isn't it? Uh, she's she's on my bucket list, Dolly Parton. I'd certainly like to talk to her. But another one that's got Dolly Parton in, a, in an album that's about to be released comes from Artemis Pyle, who was the drummer for Leonard Skinner, and he survived the plane crash in 1978 when when half the band was killed and Ronnie Van Zandt, who was the front man there, and Artemis has made his entire life and musical career out of wanting to pay homage to Ronnie's, Ronnie Van Zandt's music. And he has a new album coming out very soon that features Dolly Parton singing back up for him. Uh, the right, the right, type, right type of America, right part of America. Probably. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. that's yeah. very true. Another <laughs> lovely guy. Yeah. yeah. Can we do a, a, a bit of a speed round? Sure. Okay. And I've got a few questions written down here. When you think about your last three years, which interview stands out as a huge coup? Like that you're just amazed that you got them. 
Um, I've talked about them both. I'd have to say Gordon Lightfoot and Bobby Sherman were my were my biggest coups. Graham Nash too from Crosby, Stills, Nash, Young. He was good. And uh, Mickey Dolans from the Monkees would have to be up there also. Oh, there you go. Okay. It's funny having scanned through. I'm, I'm curious what your answers are going to be. Do you personally have a favourite artist? You know, I'd be there with you with Elvis, I think. Um, he's the one that I never got to talk to. Of the ones I've spoken to, oh, gosh, I can't even remember the... Um, you know, it's funny how they all blend into one. You, you you finish one and then you're on to the next. I can't even remember. But, but even your own soundtrack, like which which song? It's like, oh, good, I love this song, and you're just belting it out. Well, the one that comes top of mind there is George McRae, that song Rock Your Baby. I love that. Or Donna Summer um, with uh, Love to Love You. I mean, uh, those sort of songs take me back to a particularly good time of my life. And you, you highlighted where I was when <laughs> in, in your introduction. I think those ones are all about kissing boys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, earlier today when I was just prepping, the, doing the final details for this, I saw that you had interviewed, oh, is it Martha Wash? It's yes. Rain and Men. Yes. And I, I was singing it. I even looked it up on YouTube. It was like, oh, man, I, I just, yeah, that song yes, is just hilarious the story, when it came out. <laughs> The story behind that song is fascinating. That one almost didn't happen at all. That's well worth a listen, that episode. She was great. Yes. Yeah, I, I forgot about her. <laughs> Who else did you like that I've got on there? Oh, man, you know, like some of the ones that I've already mentioned, you know, running through them. Uh, yeah, just just amazing. The, the names. There's no end to it. You know, like uh, gone off. I've gone back to your homepage here now. But um, yeah. Was there an interview that surprised you? Uh, yeah, the Temptations surprised me a lot. I spoke to Glenn, Le Glenn Leonard, who was the lead singer for the Temptations, and he tells me the story of Motown and, and how he came into it a little bit late, but he talks about how it had become like a factory and talks about the rest of the artists there. So it was an interesting story, and he was great talent, as we call our interviewees. But that interview went completely gangbusters. That sits as the top episode that I've put out there. And I'm not really quite sure why, because the Temptations, yeah, they, they were great, but I would have thought that that would have resonated more with even older baby boomers than what a lot of them are, and I wasn't sure how come they found it. So that one surprised me. Uh, another one that went super well was Cool and the Gang, and uh, he talks about how their music is the most sampled music of any music out there today. I don't know if some of our listeners know what sampling means. I certainly didn't. Sampling is when an artist borrows a riff or a line or a part of, of the original tune. These days when they sample something, they actually have to pay for it. In the old days, a lot of the 70s musicians talk about borrowing or just downright stealing bits that they like from other people's music and they never paid for anything. They just used it. Hence, there were a few lawsuits that did go through as a result. But Cool and the Gang's interview comes up as my number two most uh, popular episode. And that's to me, is like a whole different demographic than The Temptations. Another one, Credence Clearwater Revival. I spoke to yeah, the drummer, yeah. Doug Cosmo Clifford. He was super interesting. And what, what was... I mean, that went really well also, but Cosmo Clifford's got Parkinson's disease and he's, as a result, his speech is now impacted. There won't be too many more interviews with Cosmo Clifford about Credence and what goes on there. And he doesn't hesitate to put the, to put the kibosh on uh, John Fogarty, I have to tell you. He talks very candidly about how he feels about John Fogarty. Um, some of the lesser known ones, Sanford Townsend's Johnny Townsend, he went really well. That that surprised me too. One that didn't surprise me and I've just redone is um, Lee Lochnane, one of the original founding members from Chicago, the band. He tells a fabulous story and the, the number of Chicago fans that are still out there today, yeah. that surprises me. They've got millions of followers today. The, the band has been constantly on the road for 56 years, even during the pandemic, and 
the, although the lineup has changed several times over, there are still three original members who have managed to maintain their families. Uh, they've kept them intact through all those years. And the fan base has only grown over the years. They blew me away with all of their stuff. Bruce Coburn was another one too. You know, when I said to my partner, I'm talking to Bruce Coburn here in Australia, he said, who? I said, what, you don't know Bruce Coburn? He's huge. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of people do know and love Bruce Coburn because he's done fabulously. And he was, he, you're probably well aware that Bruce Coburn is so intellectually smart. He made me feel, no, he didn't make me feel anything. No one can make you feel anything. I felt completely inadequate with him. He was like speaking on a whole different level than I could really get to. I try and keep my interviews kind of, you know, basic and straight and, and uh, so it appeals to the lowest common denominator. And he kind of lost me a few times with his, esoteric and, and musical intellectuality but that's part of his brilliance and uh, he is certainly brilliant I don't have to tell you sitting in Canada about that so he surprised me too he was wonderful are you ever or have you ever been starstruck yeah once I mean, twice the first time with Mickey Dolans because I felt I, I regressed. I became the 14-year-old monkeys fan that used to go to scream at their concerts or or kiss them all good night on my bedroom wall, right? So when Is it I true that he's him, the last one left? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. It's very, really sad. Uh, but he's doing some great things. He's still performing out there. And I'm still trying to get another interview with him because he's released an, a new album himself. It's not monkeys quality, but the whole story of the monkeys is fabulous. So, you know, I came off the phone with him. I didn't do him via Zoom again. It was by phone. But I came off and I was like shrieking and my partner's looking at me. He's like, what is wrong with you? Oh, my God. It was like, that was Mickey Dolan's. You don't understand. I was 14 again. It was terrific. And the other one that I got a little bit starstruck about was Graham Nash because I was so into Crosby, Stills and Nash. And he was another one that sort of gave me his philosophy on life. And it was really interesting to hear. And it was like sort of sitting down again with, with my father, I suppose, and kind of learning lessons from, from dad. So his perspective was kind of a bit intimidating, I think. He but, was very um, generous about the people in his life too. Yeah. Wow, you have listened to a few of my interviews. Have, Thank I you. Have, yeah, Thank yeah. you so much, Agnes. <laughs> you do your research well. Yeah. Well, with this, been... I couldn't help but... I mean, it's, I can't believe that people wouldn't put this automatically on their podcast list for walking. I have been, I'd listen, I'd be belting out the tunes. I'm so glad I live alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. And yeah. I'm going to slide into the realm of gossip columnists. Any good gossip? Hmm. Um, um. <laughs> well, that's good. Wow. Nothing that yeah, jumps no, out. Yeah, nothing. Well, you, you know, I mean, apart from Gordon Lightfoot slagging off on his wife or, you know, Kenny Loggins saying that he had gotten a bit fat during the pandemic because <laughs> he ate so many donuts. Or, yeah, but we all um, identify with that one. Well, there was a, the drummer of, the drummer of um, T-Rex. Did you know T-Rex? Mark Bolan and T Rex in 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 in, uh, in uh, Canada? No, not think so. Oh well, he talked about how you know he's the whole. He doesn't remember much of the seventies and eighties because he was on so many drugs and he spent a lot of time with prostitutes. And he actually married one and had a child with one. And he he was so rude about her in a kind of funny way that on YouTube, <laughs> friends of hers got on and were really angry about how he could talk so badly about this woman. <laughs> you know, I apologise, but, I mean, he, I think he'd done it in a, in, he wasn't trying to be mean about her. He was just being honest from his point of view. Um, no, I, I don't kind of get down into the weeds with them in terms of, of gossip. I, I, I don't even ask them for that and inadvertently not very much of it comes out. I mean, you know, there was some gossip about Bobby Sherman having 
had a had a an affair with the singer Salminio way back when. And, you know, many girls who were into Bobby Sherman probably wouldn't want to know that he may have been bisexual in the day. I didn't go there with him with, with that. It it you know, people had written in, I don't want to know about that. I don't want to embarrass them or talk about things that they don't want to talk about. I just want to know about their lives and their music and and the honest sort of real side of it. No. So, Agnes, I can't tell you. I can't be the bearer of any gossip, I'm afraid. I'll, I'll fill this in then just in terms of gossip as in a scoop. So you've already told us that Darlene Love is on Cher's Christmas album. So we'll take that as like, okay, got to go check that out. <laughs> we'll just call oh. it a scoop, not gossip. Can <laughs> and I it's you- well worth listening to. Oh, good. Okay. Can I ask you a personal question? Of course. I got to read this. When you were about nine years old, as soon as your parents went out, you'd grab your mother's bud vase. I grabbed my hairbrush. Now, I'd crank the tunes and sing along in full voice. You imagined interviewing the Beatles, the Monkees. I found that so interesting. Why the interviewer, not the diva? I don't know. I can't tell you the answer to that. I think if if my superpower was to be a journalist and a natural curiosity about people's lives, I guess that's when it first showed up. I do. I have no idea why. I was always intrigued and enamoured with Dinah Shaw. Do you remember her, the American TV interviewer? I was, you know, it must have been on the black and white television when I was five, six, seven years old. My parents must have watched it. And it was something about her chatting to all these stars that grabbed me rather than being one of these stars. Don't know. Don't know. I wanted to be Dinah Shaw. And uh, when they went out on a Sunday afternoon, I could talk to whoever I wanted to. I I ask myself now, how could they ever go out and leave me at home as a nine-year-old looking after my five-year-old brother? That's kind of weird. That would never happen today at all. Times were different then. (laughs) Absolutely. But I grew into that role of a journalist. And when the media called me, you know, I, I got the smell of a film studio very early because we used to do creative dance and my neighbor's mother was the creative dance teacher and she had a program on TV on the national broadcaster that was shown in all the state schools everywhere. And he and I would go every week and dance on television. And the next day we'd come and did you have theaterettes in your schools where the whole school would come and sit and watch the television? Oh, okay, so not television, no. So we would all assemble and watch that for schools program the next day. And there I was dancing on TV The you know, the limousine had come and picked me up from school and dropped me back to school. So I was a really a little bit of a starlet in those days. And the smell of film in those television studios got me. And when I started studying law, we've come full circle here. And it was so boring. I couldn't stand it. All I wanted to do was be in the media. I just knew I had to be in the media and I left and joined a radio station and, you know, as I said, did traffic reports and news reading and researching, producing, hosting my own radio show and it just hosting television shows and all sorts of different roles in television and radio. I knew I'd found my happy place and talking to people, being on, I much preferred being on behind the microphone rather than being on, in front of it, although as a news and current affairs reporter I had to do the hello and welcome to this and this is what's happened today but uh, I always preferred chatting to people and finding out about their lives and I'm often accused of asking too many questions anyway just in my daily life of people because I'm genuinely interested in people's lives doesn't mean you have to be a music star you can be anybody I'd like to talk to you and find out who you are and what makes you tick everyone's got something in them to give that comes through in your voice on your podcast, that sincerity of just you're in the moment with that one, well, however many people, but it, with that one interview, it really does come through. So that's thank that's you, great. Agnes. Thank you. Before we close, any stories you love to tell and haven't? I don't think so. I think I've, I've given you, I'm going to let me check my list quickly <laughs> to see who I've got that maybe I haven't spoken about. You're the kind uh, of person that, you know, we could probably do like five of these and I'll just pull out different interviews and say, okay. Well, like, let's I'm very happy. 
very happy to <laughs> chat with you anytime you would like to. Um, and yeah, well, I mean, as I as I check my list, the stories that the people tell me certainly come to mind. Terry Jacks is one of yours, isn't he? He's yeah. a Canadian. He did hey, Seasons in the Sun. That's wife. right. He's he's a he, unfortunately he's suffering very ill health also and couldn't speak to me. So his record company executive, because they've just re-released a whole new uh, set of Terry Jacks's best of. So I was I had been asked by a listener to track down Terry Jacks, which I managed to do, but if, he wasn't able to talk to me. And uh, the record producer who had had put out the album spoke to me and told me all about Terry's life. So I never knew what an incredible environmentalist he was, how much he's done for the planet, and, you know, as well as for music. That was, he was quite amazing. I was going to mention the environment when you said about some of these big stars, you know, they don't want to fly as far or be in the air for as long because of, you know, their aging bodies, they're, they're maybe not yeah. such great health. But I'm finding more and more people, stars, are saying, no, we're not going to take our entire crew um, I think Neil Young is one of those, you know, and and put all that exhaust into the the air and everything else, and have all those people driving to our concerts and and that sort of stuff. So environmentalism is becoming pretty big amongst a number of every generation of of star. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but if you're talking about Neil Young, it sounds like an excuse to me, um, because flying flying your crews. Not, or not flying your crew if you're Neil Young is not going to make one iota of difference to the planet's environment at all. He'd be better off donating a whole lot of money to environmental research or something, and I'm not sure that he's ever done that. Yeah, I, I don't he's, know he's one I'd really like to talk to too because I hear what a difficult person he is from some of the artists I speak to, and uh, I'd love to find that out for myself. Um, go in, go in he, via, isn't, isn't it he that the one with all the cars, the old classic cars that he must not drive anymore? Neil Young is? Oh, I is think, he? Okay. I oh, think. Oh, I'm not oh. sure. It's one of those Winnipeg guys. <laughs> okay. He's also Winnipeg. An amazing crew that came from Winnipeg. Who knew? Yeah, yeah. I knew. <laughs> you knew. Well, that's right, because that's where you are. But also what's good is that you knew from there, but... The world doesn't know those bits. So we're able to share lots of different bits with the whole world. I love that. I spoke with um, oh, Alan Clark from the Hollies. Do you remember the Hollies? Yes. UK yes. band. So he was wonderful too. He's lost his, the upper range of his vocal ability and he's put out a new album that he's written songs that only feature him down low now instead of singing all those tunes up high. He was incredible to talk to too. He survived cancer. His wife survived cancer. His daughter survived cancer. So many of them have an amazing attitude towards life that you can learn so much from too and and help one get over one's injuries. I'm I'm digressing now too. No, I know no, you no. want to get off. No, no, no. I was just trying to remember. I had to look this up. Jerry from Jerry and the Pacemakers. I was trying to remember. Jerry Marsden. Yes. He's... Yeah, he was one. Gone. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't He's gone, that. unfortunately. Oh, okay. Randy Backman was a terrific chap that I had too, talking about another. Is he Winnipeg too? Uh, yeah, because he was guess who? Yeah, yeah. Yes, he's out here on he the was. West Coast now. He's on one of the islands out here. He's, he's yes, that's right. I think he's on Vancouver Island, if I'm not wrong. He uh, yeah, is. Neighboring island, okay. Yeah. And his okay. son, Tal. Yes. Fabulous. Both of them, wonderful musicians, just so good. I try and introduce people to some, some Australian music as well, people that they've never heard of. Yeah, no, for sure. Did you ever hear of George Baker Selection with Little Green Bag? Did you ever have that song that came somewhere out of Europe? Uh, we, we had that one. It was huge here. Oh, the other one that was interesting to speak to was Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull. He was a bit oh intimidating. God. Well, it's interesting when I was scanning because oftentimes, like, I won't know the name. But because you, you know. say Little River Band's Graham Goble, is it? Right. Um, yep. It's like everybody knows Little River Band. I wouldn't have yep. known the names in the band. So, yep. yeah. 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 Noel Paul Spook, Stuckey from Peter, Paul and Mary. Okay. Wow. What a talent he is and what a lovely old man he is. <laughs> and Johnny, Johnny Mathis, who was huge in the day, probably yeah. again before you and I. He was another very difficult edit job to do. He's also suffering from something other than just old age. And what about, do you remember Mungo Jerry? Yes. Yep. 
he's a very weird man. <laughs> he would have to go down as being the weirdest person I've ever interviewed. You'll have to tune in. The other one was, um, sorry, go on. I, I was just going to ask, speaking of Olga, well, this is going to go on forever. Sergio <laughs> Mendez, how, no, no, this is fabulous. Sergio Mendez, how old would he be now? Sergio Mendes is also in his 80s yeah. and he is fabulous. He's so fit and healthy. The difference between some of them in their 80s and others yeah. is absolutely huge. Dion is 83 years old and keeps putting out new albums with, with incredible collaborators, people like Bruce Springsteen and a whole host of different people. He is fit and healthy and vibrant at 83. He's an inspiration to everybody. Uh, Marty Wilde from the UK, another one who's in, in incredible shape at 83. Some of them at 83, 85, not so good. Yeah. And then, you know, when they look so good, I want to know what what's your secret? How yeah. come you're in such terrific shape? What they do tell me is that they didn't never smoked, never took drugs, and never drank. Make and that seems to have made a huge difference. Or somebody like Dion, who's been sober for you know forty years or something, has given it up entirely. Keith Richards, he's another one that it's amazing that he's even <laughs> that he's alive. still standing, incredible, yeah, yeah. and yet he yeah. seems pretty strong and fine. And yeah, the rest yeah, of it, so. yeah. One of my other favorites that I'm putting in now that I've just remembered is um, John Kay from Steppenwolf. Okay. Magic Carpet Ride, back from 1967. So, again, you know, I was uh, a young girl back then, but that song had a big impact on me and I tracked him down. And he's also another one who never does interviews and finally relented. And he told me his story about leaving war-torn Europe with his mother and ending up in Canada before going to the States. And he's got a fascinating backstory to tell and amazing music that band made. Oh, there's so many there. And, and as I said to you, there's about there's about 60 in the pipeline just waiting to be edited. I just need four hands, not two, and probably 48 hours in every day, not 24. And no life other than doing this. Yeah. It's a shame that you can't get paid much for doing podcasts really, but it's a passion project. I'm not in it for the money. Yep. Um, I hear you. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would probably have a different tone if uh, if we were in it for just for the money. So, yeah, it's great fun, though. We're very lucky to be able to do what we do and enjoy it so much as you do yours. Similarly. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I love talking to my guests. They're, they're fabulous. And people like you contact me and I go like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, anytime you want to talk to me, again, Agnes, I'm yours. Oh, great. Okay. Where do we find you on the World Wide Web? Uh, the website address is simply a breath of fresh air.com.au. You have to put the AU in for Australia and a breath of fresh air as it's spelt all one word. And uh, on, as a podcast, it's on all major podcast platforms. Also, just type in a breath of fresh air. And I think, as you said, I love to go walking and listening to it as well or driving in the car. Uh, I mean, generally, that's what podcasts are so good for when you're just doing the gardening or out there doing something on your own and you're in your own world. But uh, I'm so glad you enjoy it. And hopefully a few of your listeners who've heard this chat will also tune into it. If if you're young and uh, happening to be listening to this, please tell your parents. If you're old, well, not old, if you're older and listening, tell your kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, for all those young people out there, don't tell your parents just yet. Go listen to a few episodes and wow them with how much you know about the people that they would sing along to and dance to before you were even around. <laughs> so, and then they'll come Good with cool. them. Yeah, Great yeah. call. Great call. Now, are you internet radio as well? Um, it does go out, as I said, through about 165 radio stations, okay. uh, various stations across the world, online, terrestrial a whole bunch of them. Yes, if you were if you went into any of the uh, radio players and typed in a breath of fresh air, you will find it also no problem oh, at various times of the week or on call, whatever. Yes, it's yeah. it's very accessible or hopefully becoming more and more accessible <laughs> anyway. 
And I think when I scroll to the very bottom of this page, you're on social too. You're all over the place, Facebook. I, I am. I've got a terrific following of people on social media. And, you know, they say to spread the word about a podcast, you have to post on social media. I feel like I'm always preaching to the converted on my Facebook page. But if you're not a member, there's some great stuff up there. And that is Sandy K presents K-A-Y-E presents a breath of fresh air. Thank you for asking me, Agnes. You're an absolute gem. No, no. A website link is always in the show notes. I put all the links on your page at our website. So people just need to scroll down and they're all there if they want to check you out on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Fabulous. Listeners, if you have thoughts on today's show, please talk to us. Leave comments where you're listening, or if you're listening at the Boomer Woman's Podcast at boomwithabang.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and talk to us there. Or who would you like to hear Sandy interview? Ask it in the comments, and I'll find out if Sandy has a segment, or maybe you'll be a guest on her show with that guest by the sounds of it. You gave us that scoop, Sandy. Leave stars and reviews where you can. They help us grow and share this episode. I can't imagine being this age and not having some favorite tunes and artists. I love listening to Sandy interview a number of my favorites. You and your friends could listen to your favorites together. Sandy Kate, thank you for being my guest and taking us on a marvelous walk down memory lane. I do my research for these conversations that can take up to a couple of hours, depending on the guest. You know that prepping for you took days because I was just loving the music and the interviews so much. So thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Agnes. It's been an absolute delight chatting with you. Have a great rest of the week.